All right, so I think we're all set and we can get started. Um, all right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to the AMD seminar series. Glad, glad to have you with us. We are also delighted to have Professor Asu Ozdagler with us today. Uh, Asu is the MathWorks Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. She is the department head of EECS, as well as the Deputy Dean of Academics in the Schwarzman College of uh, Computing. Her research expertise include optimization theory, uh, distributed optimization and control, and network analysis. For her invaluable contributions in these areas, uh, also received numerous awards, including a Microsoft uh, Fellowship, NSF Career Award, and Donald Ekman Award from the American Automatic Control uh, Council. Quite recently, she actually became an IEEE uh, Fellow. So today also is gonna tell us about analysis and interventions in uh, large network games. So also thank you again for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, with uh, all of you, uh, in particular uh, the organizers whom I know very well uh, uh, from various collaborations uh, from before. So delighted to be here. Let me quickly share my screen, uh, and then we can uh, get started. Okay, hold on. Uh, this is sorry, wrong, wrong screen. Uh, what happened to the slide? Okay, here I am. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing something weird as well, right? This doesn't seem to be connecting to my slides. Give me one second. What's happening in here? Let me maybe redo the slides. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay, let me try it now one more time. Yeah. Okay, so I will go to full screen. Perfect. Now is that is, can everyone see the slides? Perfect. Yeah. So uh, thanks again for having me. And um, so today, uh, I'd like to share with you two of our uh, recent papers, uh, where we uh, try to basically provide new tools uh, and uh, unifying frameworks for analyzing equilibria and designing interventions in large network games. And this is a joint work uh, with a, a, a brilliant researcher, Francesca Parise, who used to be at MIT. Now she's a faculty member at Cornell uh, EC. So very quickly, uh, as a motivation for our work, uh, uh, we consider social and economic settings, and in such settings, uh, who interacts with whom matters. Uh, in particular, uh, the decisions of individuals to, for instance, buy new products, adopt uh, new innovations or behaviors, form opinions, uh, contribute to public goods is very much influenced by the uh, choices of their friends and acquaintances. And similarly, uh, in more uh, IO contexts, uh, firms' uh, decisions uh, also depend on actions of other firms' uh, investments producing uh, complementary or substitute goods. So network games have emerged as a very powerful framework for analyzing these uh, various uh, sets of interactions, whereby agents interact with each other according to an underlying network represented by a graph. And in this talk, we're interested in very large graphs, very large uh, scale interactions. And uh, a distinguishing feature of these games games with respect to a general game is that the payoff function of a player depends on not the actions of every other player, but the aggregate uh, some aggregate function of actions of agents in his neighborhood. And uh, the key question in this literature most of the time is to understand how underlying patterns of interactions among the individuals shape equilibrium outcomes. So let me quickly maybe give you uh, a sense uh, with a special, very widely used canonical case, the linear quadratic network games. And in, the, in these games, we assume there are N agents uh, that are sort of uh, placed in an interaction network rep represented by this matrix G. 
think about this as some adjacency matrix. Each agent chooses some action Xi, and in the applications I'm going to talk about, you can think about this as some effort level that this, act, uh, that this agent is exerting on a particular activity. And uh, as I mentioned before, agent payoffs also are affected by some local network aggregate, Zi. Here, we're basically assuming that that is just the sum of the actions of the agent of that agent I in his neighborhood. A, a particularly important example for this is the private provision of public goods, which was studied uh, in a seminal paper by Bramulia and Cranton. Uh, so uh, agents uh, uh, exert some activity XI, uh, some effort level XI, which benefits others through social or geographic links. So this has a lot of, this covers a lot of classic examples, think about maybe health investments, vaccinations or pollution uh, prevention programs where your investment benefit other people. So we represent the, the agent cost function in this case uh, by uh, a linear quadratic form where, you know, there's a quadratic uh, term which represents the cost and there's some, uh, you know, linear affine term which represents the marginal, uh, uh, you know, which represents the marginal return times the effort level of the agent. And here alpha i determines, it's a payoff parameter that determines how much neighbor's actions affect agent's payoff. So if you think about this simple, uh, you know, structural form for the cost function, uh, one can see that the best response of an agent I given others actions is if you just take the derivative set it equal to zero, the best response Xi star or Xi best response will be beta I plus alpha I Zi of X. So I'm putting this uh, here to be able to sort of define two uh, specific uh, interaction forms. In particular, when this payoff parameter alpha I is positive, that basically is the case where agents effort will be increasing as the effort level of other agents increase. So this is the case of strategic complements. So the strategies move in the same direction. So a good example uh, that's sort of studied extensively in the literature on network games is crime or education. Uh, so friends engaging more in crime or education activities induces individuals to increase effort. So sort of think about effort levels uh, moving in the same direction, increasing in the same direction. So if alpha I is, sorry, this should be negative, uh, then the, it's the case that, you know, I's uh, best response is decreasing in the effort level of others. And this is the so-called strategic substitutes case. And this sort of uh, uh, nests a lot of the uh, public goods type examples, innovation, R&D, think about an individual or a firm uh, innovating, meaning experimenting with new technologies, generating information that benefits others. And you can think also of more, uh, computer science example, which is sort of security investments. If you have a set of connected computer systems investing in security, that reduces the probability of an attack spreading throughout the network. But then the effect of this is, you know, other agents may be discouraged to, you know, do similar because the environment is safer now. You want to invest less because it's a costly action. So whenever you have the strategic substitutes, that has the potential for creating free riding effects, uh, which is sort of a, a canonical uh, property of games with strategic substitutes. So if you look at the literature uh, on network games for tractability reasons, because this underlying network is a, you know, sometimes difficult object uh, to study, generally uh, special instances of network games were considered, mostly with scalar non-negative strategies, symmetric networks, and uh, some structural assumptions. Either, you know, the case that I talked about, linear quadratic games, which yields linear best responses and enables analysis as a linear system of equations or some potential game type of approach, or recently people have been also looking at non-linear res best responses, but as assuming monotone type assumptions so that it enables analysis. So either strategic complements or substitutes. But if you look at many of the, you know, applications, uh, economic and social applications, they involve mixed strategic effects. So it's not always, best responses are not always monotone uh, or multiple uh, activities. So you want to exert effort, not just on one activity, but multiple activities. So here I just put a simple example to sort of illustrate a non-monotone best response. 
the, so think about you know a model of races tournaments or competition where you know agent work hardest when others are also you know have similar effort le levels so this is capturing neck and neck race and then you know when you start to fall behind then your effort level also goes down because of some discouragement effect so this is sort of a the, you know uh, easy example to see you know we also need some tools and methodology to study uh, non monotone best responses so what i'll do in this talk is first i'll talk about a unified framework based on variation inequalities so uh, some tools we know very well from OR literature for uh, reformulating Nash equilibrium and studying the equilibrium properties in network games. So the properties that this kind of analysis will yield are things like existence and uniqueness of equilibrium, convergence of uh, certain uh, learning dynamics, and also uh, you know comparative statics like how does equilibrium change when you change underlying uh, properties. So what uh, I will try to emphasize is uh, sort of a uh, set of results which relates spectral properties of the network and the payoff function to the Nash equilibrium properties. And in the second part of the uh, talk, uh, I will basically focus on the large scale aspect of networks and to ask the question, how do we analyze equilibria or, and go beyond and, tar you know, how do we design interventions for such large games in a computationally efficient manner? And for that reason, uh, we will present a new class of infinite population games called graphon games. And we show that, you know, uh, equilibria and graphon games can robustly approximate equilibria of large network games sampled from the graphon. And uh, I will argue that this kind of viewpoint enables designing interventions using computationally tractable optimization problems. And I think very importantly, with much less information than knowing the underlying exact network linkages among the agents, which is a you know, uh, difficult thing to achieve, especially when you're thinking about the scale of networks we're interested in. So that's sort of the uh, you know broad outline um, of the talk. Let me um, go back a little bit and maybe introduce some notation to be able to uh, you know uh, uh, do our analysis. As I mentioned, I will be thinking about n agents interacting over a network and represented by some weighted adjacency matrix G. And uh, Gij, the ij element of this matrix, will represent the influence of agent J on agent I's payoff. And I will assume no self loops. I will just get rid of the GIIs uh, 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 for, for simplicity. And each agent has a strategy XI uh, that uh, he or she is selecting in a feasible set XI uh, to minimize his cost, which I represent as a function of his own action and this local network aggregate ZI of X, which is sort of the sum of the agent's actions in his neighborhood. And uh, the goal will be to compute its best response. It will lead to the uh, Nash equilibrium concept that I will define in a second. So some uh, assumptions uh, uh, that I will you know, adopt throughout the talk will be uh, this XI is a convex set, compact, uh, Compactness can be uh, uh, relaxed. Uh, we do that in the paper. And then for now, I will assume only some convexity in my own strategy for all x minus i or for all the i of x. And this is also smooth so that I can talk about uh, some gradients uh, and use some uh, you know, properties uh, related to gradients. So and what is a Nash equilibrium? I think this audience probably doesn't need the definition, but let me do it anyway. It's basically a point X bar, whereby um, uh, you know, no agent has any unilateral deviation that will be profitable for himself. Uh, in this case, we are uh, minimizing, so uh, uh, which is uh, you know, confusing. Um, we generally maximize in uh, you know, game talks, but uh, uh, Francesca said we're engineers, uh, let's actually minimize. So basically, X bar is one in which if you choose another action, your cost will increase. Okay, so X bar is a Nash equilibrium, clearly, uh, you know, X, that essentially amounts to saying that X bar I is the minimizer of the cost J I when I fix the other agents. And I can, I just want to show you quickly my favorite optimality conditions here over this convex set. So we can write this equivalently as saying that I take the gradient of J I with respect to X I, I take the inner product of that with any feasible direction in my Set, right? You take the gradient, negative gra the, the, the gradient itself right now, and then you look at the feasible direction. And uh, if you're at the optimum, that inner product, uh, that, that 
those two directions should have an angle which is less than 90 degrees. That's this optimality condition here. And uh, because I have n agents, what I do is I stack all of the, those together. Sort of I do F1, F2, F3. In compact form, I write it in terms of this F of X transpose. This is all of my FIs and X minus X bar. So this is exactly under the convexity assumptions I have outlined equivalent uh, characterization of the Nash equilibrium X bar for this game. So why am I using this characterization? Because that essentially is exactly the link uh, between a Nash equilibrium and its variational inequality reformulation. And let's quickly remember the variational inequality definition. Uh, we say that X bar solves a variational inequality defined by an operator F and a set X, if and only if F of X bar, X minus X bar is greater than or equal to zero for all X and X. And this is exactly the condition that I've outlined here. So X bar is a Nash equilibrium if and only if X bar solves this variational inequality where X is the Cartesian product of the individual constraint sets and F is this operator I get by stacking the individual gradients with respect to my own actions into one vector. Okay, so this is great. I mean, this is just showing that actually Nash equilibria are VIs. <laughs> uh, so why is this important? Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, this is the VI reformulation, right? X bar is a Nash equilibrium if and only if uh, this uh, condition holds. And think about now this special case, okay? Where F is integrable, meaning that there exists some P such that uh, the gradient of P is equal to F, okay? And in that case, if you substitute instead of F gradient of P, under the convexity assumptions, what this says is X bar is a Nash equilibrium if and only if X bar minimizes P of X. And this is exactly the special case where this network game is potential game with potential function P of X, okay? And this is actually a very typical approach used for the study of network games, making this assumption or making you know, uh, some uh, assumptions on the game primitives under which the underlying network game is a potential game. But I just want to argue a little bit why it may be restrictive or it may you know, just cover some you know, special cases. If you look at a, a, you know, a, a seminal paper by Munder and Shapley, uh, you know, a equivalent condition of a game being potential, at least under the uh, smoothness assumptions that I have imposed is that you look at two payoff functions, ji and jj, and you look at the cross partials and they're equal. And for at least linear quadratic games, what this is equivalent to is alpha i gij is equal to alpha jg ji. Basically, as, as this is you know, what this is doing is it's and even in the one, di one dimensional case, restricting the analysis to symmetric environments where alpha i is equal to alpha j, j i j is equal to g j i. So that's why sort of the literature focus has been on symmetric networks or such one dimensional uh, symmetric environments. So the reason I think uh, we argue that VI approach is the sort of natural approach here is that it actually allows you to go beyond uh, the case when f is, integ f is integrable. So it allows studying games that are not potential. So that's sort of one reason why I think a VI approach is powerful. And moreover, we will see that uh, you know this viewpoint allows us to think about Nash equilibrium properties in terms of the properties of what the underlying operator f that I have defined uh, here. So uh, what I will do is basically, I will think about some properties of this operator f and related to properties that studied in the VI literature and bring those uh, you know, results and properties into this network game setting to be able to establish properties of the equilibrium in a unified manner and extend the or, uh, results beyond the studies, uh, beyond the conditions that are studied in this literature. So what are the properties that uh, I'm going to consider? So this will go a little bit technical on this slide, but it's actually maybe we just stay with uh, the first condition, which is the strict monotonicity condition, which says that you take your operator F, you take the inner product of F of X minus F Y X minus Y, then that's strictly positive. So let's just draw a parallel to the potential case uh, to understand what this is. So in the potential case, remember, uh, uh, you know, uh, if uh, f is integrable, you can replace it by some gradient of some p. And this condition then becomes the strict monotonicity becomes the convexity, strict convexity of the potential function itself. So in that special case, you can think about this condition as 
some convexity conditions. So, so you go beyond the strict convexity of potential games into more general conditions where potential assumptions may not be satisfied. So that's what the role of the strict monotonicity assumption. And then you can think about, uh, you know, weakening this assumption by uh, strict monotonicity is related to, uh, you know, I will talk about this in a second, but some positive definiteness properties of the corresponding gradient of this matrix. So we also think about P matrices, which are uh, weak weakenings of these conditions. So we define this operator F to be a block P function and a P function. And a block P function is just, you know, instead of thinking about this you remember F was these FIs, right? Stacking these FIs. So instead of thinking about that inner product, some being positive, you just assume that the maximum is positive. There's one component that's positive, right? So clearly uh, if the sum is positive, there's one component that's uh, uh, positive. So that immediately implies, strict monotonicity implies log P function. And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, and uh, further weakening of that is remember FIs for multidimensional uh, constraint, multidimensional strategies, this is a vector. So you can also say that I look at all components of this, not just one to, for per player, but all of the uh, components of each of the players. And you want to have one of the, the maximum of that uh, product to be positive. So that's sort of further weakening this assumption. And when n is equal to one, these two coincide. So this will be, this middle will be our basically property for dealing with these multidimensional strategy sets. So, okay, let me now go back and see why am I interested in these conditions? Because if you look at, uh, you know, the Fakinai Peng book, uh, the classic book for, you know, uh, if you have anything, uh, you know, any work related to variation inequalities, you go to this book. So uh, there's a beautiful result that says VI will have a unique solution if your X is compact and if any of these properties hold. Okay. So you get the uniqueness property of the solution of a VI and therefore the Nash equilibrium from any of these properties. And I will do the proof of this because it's two lines and then related to something that I know, which I, I, I uh, uh, related to something we know, which, which I think is important. So uh, think about, so how do we prove, how can we prove this? Well, think about, um, you know, uh, uh, let's assume we don't have a unique solution. We have X bar and Y bar, which both satisfy the VI relation. Then if you add these and massage a little bit, you get this condition here. But if um, our F is strictly monotone, we know that uh, this inner product should be positive unless X bar, X bar is equal to Y bar. So you immediately get the uniqueness from this argument. And uh, the, the reason I actually wanted to mention this is just to show you how easy it is to sort of get uniqueness from here, but also that this is exactly the argument used in the paper by Rosen. Uh, which is an econometrica paper from a long time ago, where we, you know, very much uh, heavily rely on when we're trying to show uniqueness of an equilibrium in a game. This is exactly uh, the argument. So uh, even though it's an, it was an econometrica paper, I'm just sort of referring to it as a VI paper. Um, so it was actually a variational inequality uh, paper uh, of the time. So. So that's one sort of, I think, sort of quick way to see why these properties are important and relevant. Uh, and the next step is uh, I'm going to, I mean, these properties are, you know, fundamental, but we want to also come up with some easily checkable conditions that actually imply these properties. And for that, what I will do is go to the gradient of F and come up with properties on the gradient of F that implies these, just like for convexity, we look at the eigenvalues, right? Something, sort of something along this, uh, that line. And uh, basically, uh, and you know, I keep saying convexity, uh, even in the case where this F is not necessarily symmetric, uh, basically we can show that uh, you look at the gradient and that being positive definite is a sufficient condition to actually, uh, in a, you know, to guarantee that this is strictly monotone. And uh, I don't want to do the proof, but I always like to sort of give some idea that so that it stays in your mind why this may be true. So you can look at the F in case, uh, f of x is ax plus a, its gradient is a, right? So if you write down this inner product condition, this is exactly x minus y transpose a x minus y, and that's exactly a positive definite. So, so that's basically uh, showing that at least in the affine case, this is if and only if. For general cases, uh, I guess this is one. Um, this is just uh, one directional. 
And similarly, uh, uh, for the P function, uh, you can just look at the same gradient and that being a P matrix guarantees that this underlying operator is a P function. And that's a similar analysis. I just put for the affine case this, and you know, you just basically extract from there one element. And that's exactly the definition of a P matrix. P matrix has a lot of equivalent definitions. Uh, and in this work, we use pretty much all of them. Uh, so uh, this is just, you know, instead of the product being positive, you just have one element to be positive. And that's ex exactly uh, the definition of the P. Uh, that's, that's one of the conditions uh, that ensure that, uh, you know, A is a P matrix. And this is also, you know, uh, results one can find in fact, and Peng. So recall the note that I did not put here any condition for the block P function. So that's my next step. But I don't want to get into the details of it too much, but I still want to motivate this matrix gamma here. Um, again, let me focus on the affine case. We have this A matrix here in the affine case as our gradient. And uh, note this A matrix. So you think about it in terms of blocks. For each player, you have a block matrix, right? So you have this A11, A12, all the way to A1N. And that's a matrix itself because uh, you know each of the agents have multiple multidimensional strategies. So this matrix gamma essentially represents a one-dimensional shrinking of that matrix, one-dimensional representation of that multidimensional uh, interactions. So you look at uh, agent one's matrix A11, you take the minimum eigenvalue, and then you, you do that for the diagonal elements. And for the off diagonals, you look at the two norm and you take a minus. And why is that? It some, seems like a strange object. Well, it comes from, if you look at this inner product with these blocks, trying to come up with a lower bound on this inner product. So let me quickly say it and then I will stop there. So you, basically, if you write this inner product with this multiple dimensions, and if you, you want to come up with a lower bound on this, you pull the AII, you leave the AIJs there, and then this you can come up with a lower bound on AII by lambda min of AII. And then from here, you can come up with a lower bound using the minus two norm of that matrix. And therefore, you know, you can just get this gamma and then you know, write down a P matrix property for that gamma, which ensures this is positive, and therefore this is a block P function. Okay, so this gamma object is sort of the you know right one-dimensional object that will basically translate properties from the other sides into this uh, multi-dimensional case. Okay, so those are the properties. And let me now tell you maybe uh, uh, one more thing, uh, and then uh, it, uh, why network games is special and allows us, to, in terms of this VI approach, a tractable analysis. So if you look at F and the gradient of F, remember these are the properties uh, that we're trying to, these are the objects whose properties we're trying to study. F was, remember, the gradient of these uh, functions, payoff functions with respect to X. And if you take the gradient of that, then you get basically these J1s and then, you know, uh, the gradient with respect to X1 and X1, Hessian, uh, X1 and X2, X1 and Xn, and so on, right? So that's the structure of this gradient of F. So what I will do is now I will call these green diagonals as DIs. And for off diagonals, I will actually exploit the structure of a network game. So if you have Ji, remember it depended on Xi and some local aggregate. So if I want to get a Hesse, like a cross partial Xi, Xj, Xi only is here. Remember Gii was zero, so Zi doesn't have any Xi. So you can actually write this as using a chain rule as Xi, Zi, and you can get your Zi and take the gradient with respect to xj. And that fits basically this part, exactly gij. So this is why it's nice. This decomposition allows you to take the network out of the payoff or you know, isolate its effect in the payoff. And then I call this other part, which is sort of, although it's multidimensional, a very large network, the only thing that matters is how it you know, changes with respect to my strategy and the sum of other strategies. And I call that a ki. So that is what allows me to write for network games this gradient in terms of effects with respect to my payoff, my, my strat how my strategy affects my payoff, and then some k of x, which is this cross partial times the network. Okay, I take some Kronecker products to, to 
you know, match the dimensions, but basically here is the network and the payoff dependencies are captured with DNXK. Okay, so I think I have all the machinery. Now we can put things together. So remember, this was the, uh, these were the properties we're gonna study. Let me start by this red strict monotonicity and I, they, I won't mention anything more, it's all in the paper, but this is the structure of the analysis for all of the properties that we're studying. So I need to ensure that this is positive definite. F is not symmetric necessarily. So what do I do? I look at its symmetrized version. I look at its minimum eigenvalue. F has this nice decomposition as D plus KW. So I use that uh, to bound the eigen, the, to separate out the eigenvalues of these uh, uh, different parts. So this is lower bounded by lambda min of D plus lambda min of KW plus blah, blah. And then that is lower bounded by lambda min, but now this lambda min, the second one, I can bound it by the spectral radius minus the spectral radius. Right, that's the maximum of absolute eigen, absolute values of the eigenvalues, and then uh, I also, uh, you know, uh, using uh, the properties of spectral radius, can write it as k of x g. So basically, a condition that then enables this lambda min to be positive is, uh, you know, if you assume j i is k d strongly convex in x i, that's a lower bound on this lambda min. And if you assume this is k kappa Lipschitz continuous in zi, that's a lower bound on k kappa. And here is your network. So strong convexity plus smoothness of the payoff functions times some property of the network enables you to actually ensure that this is positive and therefore you have strict monotonicity. Okay. So that's the sort of sufficient condition that matters in these network games. Uh, and uh, from now on, what I will do is quickly. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, uh, you know, what we did in the paper is we did not stop at G2 because this literature in very disparate ways, very different analyses, looks at G2, lambda min, uh, and, you know, very different results that depends on different spectral properties of the network. So we said, given that this seems to be the object that matters, and this is how the network effect pops out, we look at different conditions, which we, you know, we considered it with G2, lambda min and g infinity. And we call these conditions alpha two, alpha min and alpha infinity. So let me quickly compare this with what is like uh, existing literature. For g symmetric, which I mentioned in the beginning is what is studied in the literature, g2 is equal to the maximum eigenvalue of g. And uh, basically this literature actually studied in, in Ballester and some of the others focused on complements and then uh, provided conditions with lambda max of G. But this is showing us the analysis that I showed. I did not assume any monotonicity, any complements. So this is basically recovering all those conditions without assuming complements uh, you know, uh, uh, on the game. Condition B uh, is related to the minimum uh, eigenvalue. There's some recent work by Alok and one or two other papers, which looks at substitute cases, uh, one dimensional uh, 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 using some structural forms on the payoff functions. And this kind of condition generalizes those uh, kinds of results for games of strategic substitutes. And the condition C is new. We haven't seen it, at least to our knowledge, uh, 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 at least when this paper was written, we didn't see any, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who have looked at this, but it seemed to us as a very natural summary of the network effect because G infinity is the maximum row sum. And what is the row sum? That's the aggregate influence neighbors exert on me. So that seems to be a very, you know, important property of the network that can also pop up in analysis. So these are three different conditions. And the next question that sort of comes to mind is which one gives us the most largest set of network games for which we can establish conditions. And that is uh, here. I mean, uh, let me show you the result, but then tell you quickly uh, where they emerge. So what this result says that, you know, uh, for the same network, the min condition gives you, uh, so, uh, for, for the same payoff parameters, sorry, the min condition gives you the largest set of networks for which you can establish uh, these conditions. And why is that? Well, that's because quickly, if you compare these blue objects, lambda min is less than rho g. For, this is for symmetric networks. Rho g is g2. So lambda min is less than g2 norm 
for symmetric networks always. So that immediately says that, you know, the first uh, alpha min condition, because lambda min may be smaller, will be larger and therefore easier to establish. So that's sort of the, uh, and then the other one between G2 and G infinity just comes from Gershborg that G2 norm is always less than G infinity. So that's sort of for symmetric networks, how the conditions uh, are related. For asymmetric networks, uh, it's a bit more difficult to explain, but I just want to say that you can find different examples for which these cover different kinds of networks. So, you know, this, there's no subset relation in the conditions for asymmetric networks. Okay, so good. So that's all I will say. I think the only thing I showed you in this talk is this first uh, result that if alpha two is positive, we have strict monotonicity. So what we do in the paper is basically study alpha two, alpha infinity and alpha min, and how or when uh, they actually, uh, you know, imply any of these conditions that I have mentioned before. So strict monotonicity, P matrix, gamma being P matrix and P functions. And, you know, I don't want to go over the details that there's I, actually, I. I mean, I, I wish I had time. It's very interesting, uh, you know, which of these properties hold under which conditions. But I want to just show you once you have this table, what you can do with it. In particular, remember Fakin and Pank said, uh, if you have a P function, you have existence and uniqueness. So you, all of these then, all of these conditions imply P function. So you can actually check existence and uniqueness under any of these conditions, okay? So the other one is uh, sort of thinking about continuity, Lipschitz continuity. That's what I was talking about in terms of how the changes in cost function or the underlying network, if you add a link, how would the equilibrium move? Uh, again, uh, for that uh, conditions to hold, uh, the Fermos in 88 showed that strong monotonicity implies Lipschitz continuity. We showed in an earlier work that block P functions uh, show Lipschitz continuity. Again, you can pull from here and ensure continuity under any of these conditions. Most interestingly, uh, convergence of best response dynamics. Uh, strict monotonicity uh, is the first thing that comes to mind uh, that, you know, if we have strict monotonicity of the underlying operator, we have convergence of best response dynamics. What we found in this paper is that that's actually not sufficient unless you have the potential structure. So it's only for strictly convex potential functions uh, that allow you to actually uh, show a sort of convergence results. But uh, this P matrix property of gamma seems like a very magical condition that enables convergence of best response dynamics. This is from a beautiful paper by Scutari and co-authors in 2014. Uh, it's an intro, it's, it focuses on communication games. So it's not easy to immediately spot this beautiful condition, but it is there. So uh, that's actually what we did here. And you can show that, uh, you know, using that P matrix property, discrete best response dynamics convergence can be established. And you know what, you can also study other kinds of dynamics. I just put here discrete best response, but for instance, alpha min does not, uh, allow you to establish convergence and we show counter examples in the paper that uh, it does not hold. Okay, so this is sort of gives us, I think a set of results under which, you know, or unifying framework for studying different properties of network games under different conditions. Let me now move on to, uh, you know, interventions because I started by saying that we want to study equilibrium with the main goal of also going to interventions, right? So how can we do incentive design? Uh, so far, I talked about connecting network structure to equilibrium properties. How do we do targeted interventions? And if you look at, there's a lot of beautiful papers in the literature that studies targeted interventions in different forms. This, many of this, bulk of this assume, uh, there's some recent papers that do some seeding beautiful results, but I mean, I think uh, with the uh, you know, continuous interventions I'm going to talk about at least, we assume full information about network. Uh, interactions. So just as a couple of examples of papers, uh, the key player paper of Ballester, who is the key player, like when you remove, that would have the most impact on the uh, uh, social welfare. 
uh, that has full information about network interactions. Ozan has a paper, uh, looks familiar, Ozan, uh, on pricing of a monopolist when consumers experience network effects. There's a recent paper by Galiotti, Goyal, and Van Golub uh, on budget allocation in network games that we have, we will uh, be building on. And there are others I also put, of course, seeding, although I'm not going to be talking about seeding type interventions here. So the, goal, the, the point is that these assume full information about the network structure. And the point is, remember, I started from large networks. Um, then you're thinking about large network games. Several issues remain, uh, particularly two that are noteworthy. First one is that if you look at intervention design, the optimization problems that are involved will be very large scale. And you know it will be scaling with the size of the network. So if you're thinking about you know, going beyond a couple hundred nodes, those problems will be difficult to solve, computationally difficult to solve. And the other problem is that, where do we have this network linkage information? Collecting this information uh, or may, assuming that we have this information may not be a good approximation because collecting them may become costly or not possible because of privacy concerns. So that sort of motivates partly our, uh, this sort of graphon uh, games approach. In particular, uh, we will assume that instead of this deterministic approach where we say, okay, here is a network, how do we analyze the, here's the G matrix, how do we analyze the, uh, you know, equilibrium or interventions, we're going to say that we have a stochastic network formation process and uh, we sample uh, some realized networks from this, uh, from this stochastic network formation model. And we define a uh, we define a, a game over this realized network. The central planner or the social planner does not know this realized network, but only that it is actually generating only, only the network formation model generating these networks. Okay. So uh, and I'm going to assume that uh, I'm going to represent the stochastic network formation uh, process using a graphon. I want to note that this approach, of course, is not uh, you know stochastic network formation models have, are used extensively in studying diffusion dynamics or related uh, you know seeding problems uh, in the literature. But what we want to do is basically define an infinite population game based on this stochastic network formation model that can approximate behavior in, in a robust way in these realized versions of these large network games. Okay, so that will be our sort of, uh, you know, uh, motivation uh, in, in, this, in this paper. Okay, so let me quickly define graphons. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very cool object. <laughs> it's a, a sort of a, a non-parametric, very rich class uh, uh, for representing networks. It's basically, a, it's, a, it's a function, a symmetric measurable function mapping the square into values of zero one. Okay, it's defined initially as the limit of a graph. And I think the maybe uh, easiest way to see it is, suppose you have five agents, think about its uh, pixelated uh, adjacency graph. Okay, sort of the here the values are color co coded in this gray scale. And to increase the number of agents, as you increase n using the same zero one, these squares get smaller and smaller. And then in the limit, you go into this graphon object. Okay, so in that way, you can think about W at U and V as the level of representing the level of interaction between these infinitesimal U and V. So the other interpretation of graphons is that it defines a probability distribution over the space of networks. And you can sample from this uh, distribution in the following way. Uh, you can, if you want to generate, for instance, a network with five nodes, you pick uniformly at random uh, uh, five, five points from zero to one, okay? You want to U5, similarly, you place them, you want to U5 here. And then for each pair, you connect them independently with Bernoulli probability coming from the graphon. So you look at, for instance, one and two, there's two, and then you say W of U1, U2 is this, and that's exactly the probability that I will connect these nodes with. And you can see that, for instance, this generalizes erdos -Reni. If your graphon is constant, that's erdos -Reni. If your graphon is maybe you know, piecewise constant, 
then it's the stochastic block model. So this is richer than those uh, you know, models that we use extensively in network analysis. And this has become quite popular uh, uh, as, as, the, as a you know, conceptual object in several uh, sets of problems that I put here. And I'm going to use it to define games. So how will I do that? It's basically going to be a mapping of network games into Graphon games. So remember, network games was N nodes, strategy XI, payoff, J of XI, ZI. OK, now Graphon game will be a continuum of agents in this interval 0 to 1. OK, and so each agent U will pick a strategy X of U again in, in the set, uh, uh, you know, either R or, a, you know, we can also put a constraint set. And then the cost functions will depend on my strategy and this local aggregate Z of U. Remember the local aggregate? The only difference is that now we have an infinite object. Instead of summing over n, we take the inter we integrate it using this graphon. So z of u will be look at agent u, and then his neighborhood, and then uh, you know uh, the intensity of you know uh, weigh it with the intensity of interactions with the uh, agents v. So that's sort of something that we capture the local aggregate with. And then the Nash equilibrium definition is exactly the same. Let me not go into that. Uh, the, I think only difference here is we have an infinitely many agents. And uh, the Nash equilibrium now, remember in the finite case, it was a vector, right? Corresponding to action of each of the agents. Now it's a function corresponding to uh, zero one agents. Okay. Um, so and a quick thing is, remember, adjacency matrix was very important for us to study equilibria. The, this was the G. And uh, this, a, a sort of a similar uh, role is played by the so-called graphon operator. And graphon operator is exactly like the adjacency matrix. It's a linear operator mapping functions to functions, just like adjacency matrix maps vectors to vectors. So you get a function. Graphon operator just computes this integral, OK? And then the first theorem, I think, uh, is now uh, everything I talked about. We just have this theorem in the paper. But the, the theory I talked about in the, in the previous case, now that can be developed for this kind of games. Instead of the lambda max of g, we look at the lambda max of this operator w. It's just we have to deal with sort of uh, eigenvalues of this infinite dimensional object. OK, but then, you know, if you have this is exactly the condition I showed you before. Kappa D minus Kappa K here, the strong convexity, Lipschitz continuity parameters of the payoff function, lambda max of W ensures existence and uniqueness. OK, so let me go from here to how we use this object as approximations. Um, remember, I had the graphon. I was sampling networks from that graphon. Let me now see how I can actually think about behavior on these objects. So, uh, so the, 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 in, the, in the Graphon game, the, the strategies of the players 0 to 1 will be a function like this, right? I want to compare it with the behavior in these sample games. But note that the behavior in here is a vector. This is a five-dimensional vector, action of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in order to compare the two, what I do is I just do an interpolation, step function interpolation, so that I talk about functions on both sides. And then I try to see if I take n larger and larger, can the, the behavior here approximate the behavior here for all of these uh, realizations. And you know, of course, uh, the, 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 we sort of drew this uh, with a specific agenda that it actually is pretty close. And that's exactly going to be our result, basically saying that under some properties on the Graphon operator, this is Lipschitz continuity. Actually, you can also do it for piecewise Lipschitz continuous. With high probability, the Graphon equilibrium and the Nash equilibrium in these sampled games, you know, gets closer and closer with this rate as n goes to infinity. Okay, so you can sort of get a sense of some, you know, approximation guarantee. Uh, which sort of is square root log n over n. And the proof of this is uh, basically, uh, you know, you try to, uh, uh, you try to uh, bound the difference between the original graphon 
and some you know pixelated or you know uh, the step function version of it and then you show that remember it's it's actually very uh, intuitive because graphon remember the way i defined it also was it's the limit of these pixelated adjacency graph right so the continuity is there but this result in addition shows a convergence rate result or a, a log n over n type result uh, for how good an approximation that is under some assumptions on the graphon okay so that shows us that we can approximate behavior. Let me also try to argue why I feel, or we feel, Francesca and I are very excited that this is actually a good approach to think about interventions. And to study interventions, I will go back to this paper of Galeotti and exactly uh, adopt their framework in terms of how they formulate, you know, how they do this uh, incentive design. So they look at linear quadratic network gains, like here, and they assume that they can change this marginal return. Okay, so it was it used the original is beta i, so they assume that they can add some beta i hat. So let's just say that our welfare maximization problem is uh, maximized now the minus of the costs, uh, some of the costs, uh, and uh, uh, you know let me I think I had another bullet here that I removed basically at the equilibrium. Remember x i was alpha z i plus beta i beta i hat. So if you if you substitute that into the payoff, essentially you get you can write this as norm of the equilibrium square times one over two n. Okay, so the welfare maximization problem for this linear quadratic games becomes maximized norm of the equilibrium parameterized by beta hat squared, and then we also assume that uh, you know we have a budget on the interventions. We assume some convex cost on the budget. Okay, so that uh, it's more costly to, to put more effort in. And this is a sort of a formulation that Ben and co authors had. Uh, and you can, this is a quadratic problem, quadratic objective and quadratic constraints. You can write it as an STP of dimension n plus one. Um, but, uh, you know, it's nice, convex and all that, but uh, because n is large, this becomes uh, challenging to solve if you go beyond a few hundred hundreds of nodes. And, uh, you know, in this paper, uh, uh, the authors suggested using a network heuristic. So instead of, you know, solving this problem, uh, which will depend on the network structure, they try to show that you can just use the dominant eigenvector of G. And in, they sort of showed cases where this is actually a good heuristic uh, to, to, you know, uh, approximate uh, the optimal incentive uh, provided uh, to this system. So that's that paper. But the point is that both the network optimal and the network heuristic require exact network data. In order to compute the dominant eigenvector, you need to know G. Okay, so the sort of proposed approach uh, that we are advocating is that, suppose I know the graphons, can I design interventions in the graphon space and I apply it to these sampled networks? Okay, how do we do this? I will define an equ equivalent problem in the graphon space, which is, you know, remember norm square maximize subject to uh, budget. And of course, uh, you're going to immediately tell me, I'm sure Ozan will uh, tell me, uh, well, also, this is an infinite dimensional problem. So I don't know how you're making our life any easier here. Just hold on there for a second. Suppose we're going to do something with it. But suppose I can solve this problem. And then what I do is uh, this is now a function, right? It's not a vector anymore. Uh, and then I compute the intervention for the sampled network using, remember, I was sampling these points, UIs. I sampled that intervention. And then I put some normalization to satisfy the budget constraint. OK, so good. And then similar to the approximation result that I just talked about, we can show that this kind of uh, you know, sampled intervention from the graphon actually uh, gives you approximate optimality uh, with a factor that goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. OK, so then it's a, it's a good factor. It approximates nicely. But the question remains, how do I solve this? And the answer is you can't, <laughs> not for any graphon, but for a large class of graphons, you can. And that's sort of uh, this uh, sort of uh, this slide. How do we solve this problem? Well, the key idea is the following. I will, because this is quadratic, I will just use, uh, you know, 
change of coordinates, just like Ben did, right? Ben was arguing that the dominant eigenvector was a good approximation. I will do that kind of, you know, uh, uh, that kind of uh, decomposition in the graphon space using the eigenfunctions of the graphon operator. So uh, uh, here uh, we use the sides, which are the basis for this graphon operator. And you can, you know, you can expand the function in that basis. And remember, uh, for linear quadratic games, uh, graphon equilibrium takes this form, i minus alpha uh, w inverse beta plus beta hat. This is sort of for linear quadratic games, you can write down the equilibrium in explicit form this way. So what is this inverse? I can write it using its power series uh, uh, expansion. And then uh, wh beta plus beta hat, these are all functions. Now I use my expansion in terms of this basis here beta r plus beta r hat. I pull beta r's out, and then it's wh times the eigenfunctions. Well, that then is the eigenvalues times the eigenfunctions of the graphon operator. So if the graphon is a finite rank one, and that essentially means that that's the structure I was telling you. If it has finitely many eigenvalues that are distinct from zero, then this infinite sum simplifies from one to R. I'm being a little bit sloppy here, but just, just you know, to give the idea from one to R. And basically it reduces, comes back to a finite dimensional problem again. Okay, so from infinite dimensions, I went to finite dimensions. So this problem, when we have a finite rank graphon, can actually be, uh, uh, can actually be written equivalently as a problem Quadratic problem, quadratic constraints. You may be thinking, uh, so the problem with number of nodes was a quadratic problem with quadratic constraints, but that was in the dimension n, number of nodes. This is dimension r, which is the rank of the graphon. Okay. So just give you, let me give you an example. I'm running out of time, so I will not. This is actually a nice example to go over. For stochastic block models, that is a graphon whose rank is exactly the number of communities, okay? So for instance, if you have an SPM, the intervention problem will be one in which its dimension will be equal to the number of communities in your network generating model. And you can find other interesting graphons where this finite rank property holds, even if, you know, the, the stochastic block model is a finite type, uh, you know, you, every agent has a finite type. There are infinite type graphons, which also have finite rank. So I think it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer. Maybe this is in the literature. When is a graphon finite rank? What does it, how, what kind of, you know, structures it captures and so on. But this is just saying that if you have a finite rank graphon, your computational problem actually uh, simplifies. Okay. So I will just in the remaining one to two minutes, uh, just do a case study. I mean, th I think this is now very ripe, uh, this framework for doing data analysis and interventions in a variety of settings. We just did a simulation study here. So very back of the envelope calculations, but I want to share with you. We considered uh, you know, a simulated data set of 80 networks representing interactions in 80 villages. We assumed agents interact according to a stochastic block model with four communities. We were very much building on this paper by Banerjee et al, Jackson and others where they were studying microfinance programs in India, linear quadratic payoffs again. And we considered two scenarios for acquisition of network data following, this is also a very nice paper by Breza. There are two ways of acquiring network data. One is called detailed relational data. There you need to ask every agent, who are your neighbors? My neighbors are Wahide and Ozan. So that's essentially the entire network. The other one is an aggregate data. You only ask a subset of agents, how many of your neighbors belong to each community? Just the type of the agents, okay? So much less, uh, you know, much higher, uh, you know, aggregated uh, data than what you would get with DRD. And actually Breza uh, et al. Uh, studied these two kinds of data collection processes and showed that in this particular example, it leads to 70, 80% cost reduction. I can't remember what how they measure cost, but that sort of, I mean, I think it's obvious that one is much more costly than the other one. We also assume access to a census about agent level information. We know the agent type, 
which community they belong to. We also assume equilibrium strategy. Uh, we know the equilibrium strategy before the intervention, how much to invest in the microfinance program. And then uh, we assume that we also know the technology, the level of technology, marginal return beta I, okay? So that's our assumptions. The, the central planner does not know the stochastic, he knows it's a, a stochastic block model, doesn't know the parameters of the, uh, of the network model, nor the payoff parameter, alpha. Those are things that you can, I mean, these are things that you can have access to, not the others. So the others are uh, objects that we need to estimate. So we also did this sort of simple estimation. Again, I'm just, you know, this, we don't assume any noise, no instrumental variable. So this is very simple, um, this square regression. But what can you, what you can do with this is if you have access to DRD, you can construct the exact network. You can compute the Nash equilibrium. Well, uh, actually, you can compute, and you have access to Nash equilibrium before the intervention. Then, using the uh, form of the again, this as I said, we assume that this is uh, without noise. Uh, what the equilibrium is, you can just do least square regression to be able to estimate uh, the payoff parameter. Okay. Uh, and then with this information, you can compute network optimal and network heuristic. With ARD, you have to do a little bit more work. You can use the ARD to estimate the probability of an agent being in a community, namely the sizes of the communities using, you know, you look at uh, the census data, how number of agents in the community divided by total number of agents in the census. And then you look at the maximum likelihood estimate of the interaction probability of agents between community H and H prime, again, just by looking at ratios. And then you look, you use the graphon equilibrium uh, to estimate the payoff parameter and you show that uh, that is, again, you have to show some limiting argument that for uh, realized networks that's close to this. So that gives you basically, uh, you can infer the payoff parameter from the graphon equilibrium here. So you do least square regression on the graphon equilibrium. And using this information now, you can compute the graphon heuristic that I have just outlined using a computationally efficient manner with a four dimensional optimization problem, okay? And the final uh, uh, sort of uh, thing is we just uh, try to sort of show how close we are to the optimum uh, uh, using these different approaches. Uh, if you look at uh, 300 nodes, network optimal gives you 25% increase with respect to a homogeneous intervention. You just give the, you know, whatever your uh, budget was, you just divide it equally across agents. 25% uh, above that with network optimal. Network heuristic gives you 12% above that. Graphon optimal gives you 22.8%. If you go to 600, this is how the numbers look like. If you go to 1000, you can't compute the network optimal. Graphon still gives you 20.6%. So that's why I like it. Okay, so, the, so again, this is, I think, a very uh, uh, start uh, of the, the use of this framework. I think it's a new conceptual approach for designing interventions. There's a lot of generalizations uh, one can think about. I only talked about continuous games here, continuous actions. One that's super interesting, I think, is discrete action games. And Francesca has a very nice paper on that with Salman and Alex uh, looking at linear threshold models in graphons, which comes from coordination games, which are discrete action. So how about other discrete action games? That's an how about other diffusions? They basically show that, you know, LTM is a very difficult thing to study on, uh, find, you know, uh, on networks, trying to characterize its behavior. So what they do is they study on graphons and they show that they can actually approximate the behavior of LTM uh, using the similar approach. Again, I showed you a very simple example of how one can estimate graphons and peer effects using SPMs. How about general graphons? There are a lot of data sets where you have very different observational models. How can actually one think about these things? And then also going beyond just normal form games. How can we go to dynamic games? And there's some very recent work on that also thinking about graphon mean field games. So going beyond mean field, which is very homogeneous setting to heterogeneous setting using this graphon idea. And uh, Peter Kane's group, as well as Rene Carmona and co-authors have some recent papers on that. So with that, let me conclude and thank the organizers again for having me. All right, thank you very much, Asu, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I wanna kind of open it up to question uh, from the audience. Uh, all right, so if you have a question, feel free to just raise your hand. Uh, 
So I actually have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. In the meantime. Also, this was great, both the first part and the second part, super elegant. Thank you. And during the talk, I was thinking um, that it's actually really interesting to be analyze network game sort of type that, that you described and come up with interventions using the Graphon machinery. And I'm wondering now if it is possible to apply to other sorts of network games. And your last bullet point here touched upon that uh, a little bit. But in particular, I have the following type of uh, network games in mind. Um, thinking about buyer, buyer seller networks, by part type network, you have buyers on one side, sellers in the uh, on the other side. So I can come up with uh, models of network markets, uh, you know, using uh, you know this methodology, and then one can study various interventions to the market, um, to this you know bipartite uh, network, to achieve certain desired outcome. If I am uh, following it correctly, in the context of the um, you know uh, graphon uh, technology that you are studying, this is really uh, defining a W function that has um, off diagonal uh, blocks that are non-zero and zero elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a bipartite structure, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'm, I guess the question is, do you know of any work that has actually focused on that? Because it seems like this is one area where um, one can uh, study the induced games uh, quite nicely using the machine. I already. love it. Uh, it's the first, uh, the, this is the paper. Uh, I mean, the, for the first time we studied Graphon games, Ozan, and the one that we focused on is really stochastic block model. Right. And uh, we also studied some uh, sort of uh, uh, location game uh, type graphons where, you know, uh, just like a, a hoteling model type, uh, uh, you know, uh, encoding that kind of structure. We have not looked at anything beyond that, but I think I would be very interested to see, especially for bipartite structures, what kind of graphon, what are the properties, how can you think about, uh, again, similar to this uh, both anal analysis, but more importantly, uh, designing intervention. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I actually had one other quick question. Uh, maybe I can mention that because you mentioned the stochastic uh, block model, it's intuitive that you'll get um, low dimension there. And um, uh, that made sense to me. At the same time, um, it got me uh, wondering, it seems like um, like what you would do with singular really decomposition, even if uh, you know uh, some of your eigenvalues are non-zero, you can perhaps focus on the largest uh, eigen or singular values, stick to them and still establish an approximation that's um, what ben did, did right that's what ben did look looking at the largest in the finite case so he looked at the dominant eigenvalue uh, that was the heuristic he was considering so, so for the graphon so your question is for the graphon even if they don't have finite rank structure maybe we actually do some uh, exactly. approximation and i still get good results and yes absolutely that, that's i was focusing on optimal but that would be a heuristic that would uh, you know, especially with some decay condition, right? There are, but I, I just don't know enough, Ozan. I mean, I think you're studying the graphons, when do they have finite tank? When do they have this decay condition? How, you know, large are these classes? And then what kind of computational properties these uh, imply? That's all interesting question. Perfect, thank you so much, Elsa. All right, great. So let me read one question from, uh, from the audience, from Irada. Uh, I think the question is about uh, how can this theory be combined with machine learning? Uh, so the question, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about that. Machine learning. Um, so we have some machine learning here. We're doing yes. some least square regression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, think, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I think uh, 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 there's definitely a lot of, uh, I think this is my bullet here, right? Going beyond SPM to be able to estimate these uh, graphons and peer effects. And that, that's where, where one needs to do some more, I think. I made a lot of simplifying assumptions here uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, like I really, really the ideal situation, no noise, nothing. And then I'm trying to think also you know, even the assumption of an SPM makes the assumption that, you know, you have finite types for the agent, so you know the types of the agents. So one can actually go beyond this to say that, and, you know, think about what an SPM could represent. These are communities, right? This could be, uh, you know, in a school, uh, boys and girls or different, uh, you know, uh, nationalities. And the one question that's, I think, of great interest is which of these types are most relevant for equilibrium properties? 
right? So you would like to do some feature extraction. Yes. yes. So, okay, here is machine learning, I think very, very relevant because one can think about automatically, the, so move beyond the ideal assumptions that I have made in this you know, analysis, final analysis, and come up with data-driven approaches to be able to estimate these types, which are really what is encoding your underlying graph on, and then see from there how it actually affects the, uh, you know, uh, so you have to first do the training in trying to figure out, you know, how what the graphon should be that captures these different features, and from there uh, do the intervention. So absolutely, uh, it's just not something we have done yet. But I hope it's clear where you know uh, it's very actually relevant in the sense of figuring out automatically in a data-driven way what are the types that I here assume that you know are the properties that dictate the equilibrium. Yeah, great. So hopefully, uh, Irada, if you have a further question, feel free to... Okay. I hope it's she clear, said... Irada. I don't see you, but... Uh... So, uh, yeah, you can also ra it. raise your hand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, uh, I think that the answer was great. So thanks so much. Uh, there is another question. Uh, Kai, would you like to uh, ask your question yourself or I can read it? So let's see. Okay, great. So I'm going to allow... Uh, all right. Thank you for a great talk. So I can see in your talk, you primarily focus on the sufficient condition of the uniqueness of the Nash equilibrium, right? Mm -hmm. And also the intervention on it. So are you aware of that anything that can handle multiple equilibria or, or possibly also the intervention problem on multiple equilibria? Uh, so let me make sure I understand the question because you mentioned sufficient. So you're saying even if I don't have uniqueness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe like, uh, suppo suppose that you have some kind of like optimistic or pessimistic equilibrium mm -hmm. selection, like mm -hmm. choosing among all the, all the equilibrium. All yeah, the equilibrium. I mean, uh, so where I use uniqueness here is, of course, I in the intervention part, that's another extension one can think about. I assumed basically I know the form of the uh, uh, yeah, lin linear quadratic case as a unique equilibrium, and I know it's structure. That's what I use to be able to design the interventions, right? So when you have multiple equilibria, one needs to first focus on, you know, some reasonable uh, equilibrium selection uh, process. And then, you know, justify that, you know, I can focus on in this setting, this particular equilibrium and do the intervention based on that. So yes, the answer is yes, but it requires some work to be able to do that for multiple equilibria in a robust way. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Great. So there are a couple more questions. Um, Shuang. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a very uh, quick question on the um, conditions uh, on the graphons when you show the convergence. Uh, so the underlying condition now we have is uh, Lipschitz condition. Um, so I, I, in some sense, it feels like uh, I feel like it is uh, quite uh, um, maybe restricted to a very small class of graphons. So yes, you, I'm so glad you caught it. Yes. Uh, can you? Yeah, yeah. I, let me comment on that. It's not just Lipschitz actually, because if it's just Lipschitz, for instance, it doesn't cover SPMs. Uh, yeah. I put it there because uh, you know I wanted to, to have the slides a little bit you know, less uh, crowded. So you can actually extend it to piecewise Lipschitz also so that you can cover the SPMs. And um, the other thing I want to add is actually in our original, uh, when we first had the results, we did not have any assumptions actually using uh, Lovash's, uh, if you look at some of Lovash's papers, we were using how he was, uh, you know, so as I said, the result is how you approximate the graphon with its pixel, with its uh, stepwise version. So Lavash's results of this sort uh, without restrictive assumptions on the graph on itself. And if you use that methodology, you can still get convergence, but with a rate one over log n, like very terrible rate. So what we did is we said, okay, if you have more assumptions on this, which is this piecewise uh, Lipschitzness, and that's actually a paper that, uh, another paper I would like to highlight that Francesca worked on uh, with some other co-authors where they actually looked at these kinds of continuity properties. It's a beautiful result, which shows that under that kind of uh, structure, 
the convergence rate is much faster. So my answer is, uh, let me repeat, basically you actually get convergence still without any assumptions, but then, uh, you know, it's not a very good approximation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, great. Um, if there's no more question from the audience, let me finish by one question uh, myself. So just uh, enjoyed both parts of the, uh, your talk, just uh, trying to connect them together. I would imagine that for certain classes of graphons, uh, computing alpha two and lambda mean things like that are also uh, kind of more tractable, right? Compared to like a general uh, network structure. For some graphons, yeah. right? not for all. Yeah. I mean, sure. I, it's under sure. some assumptions. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think stochastic block model is one. What I'm very interested in is going beyond finite types mm -hmm. because that will be, uh, but we have an example in the paper, for instance, we, we have infinitely many times, and it's very engineered example. Francesca basically engineered it carefully, but there's something there. Even with infinite types, there are graphons which have this kind of tractable structure. So I think it is of interest to see what kind of uh, graphons give rise to this sort of uh, more tractable, uh, as Ozan mentioned, eigen, you know, dominant eigenvalue type. Spectral of, analysis yeah, of the yeah, of that. And I'm sure there is in the literature, one needs to look at it to understand more and apply in this setting. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right. So again, thanks so much for the uh, excellent talk. And uh, we really appreciated your uh, participation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great seeing you all. Thank you, Astrid. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.